the type of reasoning that takes place in uh, LLM is very, very primitive. And the reason you can tell it's primitive is because the amount of computation that is spent per token produced is constant. So if you ask a question and that question has an answer in a given number of token, the amount of computation devoted to computing that answer can be exactly estimated. It's like, you know, it's how, it's the, the size of the prediction network, you know, with its 36 layers or 92 layers or whatever it is, uh, multiplied by number of tokens. That's it. And so essentially, it doesn't matter if the question being asked is, is simple to answer, complicated to answer, impossible to answer because it's undecidable or something. Um, the amount of computation the system will be able to devote to that to the answer is constant or is proportional to the number of tokens produced in the answer, right? This is not the way we work. The way we reason is that when we're faced with a complex problem or a complex question, we spend more time trying to solve it and mm -hmm. answer it, right? Because it's more difficult. There's a prediction element. There's an iterative element where you're like... Uh, adjusting your understanding of a thing by going over, over and over and over. Uh, yeah. There's a hierarchical element, so on. Does this mean it's a fundamental flaw of LLMs, or yes. does it mean that <laughs> there's more part to that question? <laughs> now you're just behaving like an LLM, <laughs> immediately <laughs> answering. No, that that is just the low level world model on top of which we can then build some of these kinds of mechanisms, like you said, persistent long-term memory or uh, reasoning, so on. But we need that world model that comes from language. Is it, maybe it is not so difficult to build this kind of uh, reasoning system on top of a well-constructed world model. Okay, whether it's difficult or not, the near future will will say because yeah. a lot of people are working on yes. uh, reasoning and planning abilities for for dialogue systems. Um, I mean, if we're even if we restrict ourselves to language, uh, just having the ability to plan your answer before you answer, mm -hmm. uh, in terms that are not necessarily linked with the language you're going to use to produce the answer, right? So the, this idea of this mental model that allows you to plan what you're going to say before you say it. Mm -hmm. um, that is very important. I think there's going to be a lot of systems over the next few years that are going to have this capability. But the blueprint of those systems would be extremely different from autoregressive LLMs. So um, uh, it's the same difference as the difference between what psychology is called system one and system two in humans, right? So system one is the type of task that you can accomplish without like deliberately, consciously think about how you do them. You just do them, you've done them enough that you can just do it subconsciously, right? Without thinking about them. If you're an experienced driver, you can drive without really thinking about it and you can talk to someone at the same time or listen to the radio, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you are a very experienced chess player, you can play against a non-experienced chess player without really thinking either. You just recognize the pattern and you play, mm -hmm. right? That's the system one. Um, so all the things that you do instinctively without really having to deliberately plan and think about it. And then there is all the tasks where you need to plan. So if you are a not so experienced uh, chess player or you are experienced but you play against another experienced chess player, you think about all kinds of options, right? You, uh, you think about it for a while, right? And you... You're much better if you have time to think about it than you are if you are if you play blitz uh, with uh, limited time. So, and um, so this type of deliberate uh, planning, which uses your internal world model, um, that's system two. This is what LLMs currently cannot do. Well, so how how do we get them to do this? Mm -hmm. Right? How, how how do we build a system that can do this kind of uh, planning that or reasoning that devotes more resources to complex problems than to simple problems. And it's not going to be autoregressive prediction of tokens. It's going to be more something akin to inference of latent variables in um, you know, what used to be called uh, probabilistic models or graphical models and things of that type. So basically the principle is like this. You, you know, the prompt is like uh, observed uh, variables. Mm -hmm. And what your what the model does is that 
it's basically a measure of, it can measure to what extent an answer is a good answer for a prompt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so think of it as some gigantic neural net, but it's got only one output, and that output is a scalar number, which is, let's say, zero, if the answer is a good answer for the question, and a large number if the answer is not a good answer for the question. Mm -hmm. Imagine you had this model. If you had such a model, you could use it to produce good answers. The way you would do is, you know, produce the prompt and then search through the space of possible answers for one that minimizes that number. Mm -hmm. um, that's called an energy-based model. But that energy-based model would need the, the model constructed by the LLM. Well, so uh, really what you need to do would be to not uh, search over possible strings of text that minimize that uh, energy. But what you would do is do this in abstract representation space. So in, sure. in sort of the space of abstract thoughts, you would elaborate a thought, right? Using this process of minimizing the output of your, your model, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is just a scalar. Um, it's an optimization process, right? So now the, the way the system produces its answer is through optimization um, by you know, minimizing an objective function, basically, right? Uh, and this is, we're talking about inference, we're not talking about training, right? The system mm -hmm. has been trained already. So now we have an abstract representation of the thought of the answer, representation of the answer. We feed that to basically an autoregressive decoder, uh, which can be very simple, that turns this into a text that expresses this thought. Okay, so that, that in my opinion, is the blueprint of future dialogue systems. Um, they will think about their answer, plan their answer by optimization, before turning it into text. Uh, and that is Turing complete. Can you explain exactly what the optimization problem there is? Like, w what's the objective function? It, it just link on it, you, you kind of briefly described it, but over what space are you optimizing? The space of representations. Okay. Those so, abstract representations. Abstract rep so you have an abstract representation inside the system, you have a prompt, the prompt goes to an encoder, produces a representation, perhaps goes through a predictor that predicts a representation of the answer, of the mm -hmm. proper answer. But that representation may not be a good answer because there might, there might be some complicated reasoning you need to do, right? So, um, so then you have another process that takes the representation of the answers and modifies it so as to minimize uh, a cost function that measures to what extent the answer is a good answer for the question. Now, uh, we we sort of ignore the the fact for I mean the the issue for a moment of how you train that system to measure whether an answer is a good answer for for a sure, question. But right? suppose such a system could be created. Right. But what's the process? This kind of search like process. It's a optimization process. You can do this if if the entire system is differentiable. That Scalar output is the result of you know running through some neural net, mm -hmm. uh, running the answer, the representation of the answer through some neural net. Then by gradient descent, by backpropagating back propagating gradients, you can figure out like how to modify the representation of the answer so as to minimize that. So that's still like, a gradient based. It's gradient based inference. So now you have a representation of the answer in abstract space. Now you can turn it into text, mm -hmm. right? And the cool thing about this is that. The representation now can be optimized through gradient descent, but also is independent of the language in which you're going to express the answer. Right, so you're operating in this abstract representation. I mean, this goes back to the joint embedding. Right. That is better to work in the, uh, in the space of, I don't know, or to romanticize the notion like space of concepts versus yeah. the space of concrete sensory information. Right. Okay. But is, can can this do something like reasoning, which is what we're talking about? Well, not really, in a, only in a very simple way. I mean, basically, you can think of those things as doing the kind of optimization I was, I was talking about, except they optimize in the discrete space, which is sure. the space of possible sequences of, of tokens. And they do it, they do this optimization in a horribly inefficient way, which is generate a lot of hypotheses and then select the best ones. Mm -hmm. And that's incredibly wasteful in terms of uh, computation. Because you have you run you basically have to run your LLM for like every possible, you know, generated sequence. Um, and it's incredibly wasteful. Um, so it's much better 
to do an optimization in continuous space where you can do gradient descent as opposed to like generate tons of things and then select the best. You just iteratively refine your answer to, to go towards the best, right? That's much more efficient. But you can only do this in continuous spaces with differentiable functions. You're t talking about the reasoning, like ability to think deeply or to reason deeply. How do you know what is an answer uh, that's better or worse based on deep reasoning? Right, so then we're asking the question of conceptually, how do you train an energy-based model, right? So energy-based model is a function with a scalar output, just a number. Mm -hmm. You give it two inputs, X and Y, mm -hmm. and it tells you whether Y is compatible with X or not. X you observe, let's say it's a prompt, an image, a video, whatever. And Y is a proposal for an answer, a continuation of the video, um, you know, whatever. And it tells you whether Y is compatible with X. And the way it tells you that y is compatible with x is that the output of that function would be zero if y is compatible with x, and would be a, a positive number, non-zero, if y is not compatible with x. Okay, how do you train a system like this at a completely general level? Is you show it pairs of x and y that are compatible, a question and the corresponding answer, and you train the parameters of the big neural net inside uh, to produce zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that doesn't completely work because the system might decide, well, I'm just going to say zero for everything. So now you have to have a process to make sure that for a, a wrong y, the energy would be larger than zero. And there you have two options. One is contrastive method. So a contrastive method is you show an x and a bad y, and you tell the system, well, that's, you know, give a high energy to this, like push up the energy, right? Change the weights in the neural net that computes the energy so that it goes up. Um, so that's contrastive methods. The problem with this is if the space of Y is large, the number of such uh, contrastive samples you're going to have to show is gigantic. But people do this. Mm -hmm. they, they do this when you train a system with RLHF. Basically what you're training is what's called a reward model, which is basically uh, an objective function that tells you whether an answer is good or bad. And that's basically exactly what, what this is. Mm -hmm. So we already do this to some extent. We're just not using it for inference. We're just using it for training. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is another set of methods which are non-contrastive, and I prefer those. Uh, and those non-contrastive methods basically say, uh, okay, the energy function needs to have low energy on pairs of XYs that are compatible, that come from your training set. How do you make sure that the energy is going to be higher everywhere else? And the way you do this is by uh, having a regularizer, a criterion, a term in your cost function that basically minimizes the volume of space that can take low energy. And the precise way to do this is all kinds of different specific ways to do this depending on the architecture, but that's the basic principle. So that if you push down the energy function for particular regions in the XY space, it will automatically go up in other places because there's only a limited volume of space that can take low energy, okay? By the construction of the system or by the regularizer, regularizing function. We've been talking very generally, but what is a good X and a good Y? What is a good representation of X and Y? Because we've been talking about language, and if you just take mm -hmm. language directly, that presumably is not good. So there has to be some kind of abstract representation of ideas. Yeah. So you, I mean, you can do this with language directly um, by just you know, x is a text, and y is a continuation of that text. Yes. Um, or x is a question, y is the answer. But you're you're saying that's not going to take. It. I mean, that's going to do what LLMs are doing. Well, no. It depends on how you how the internal structure of the system is built. If the, if the internal structure of the system is built in such a way that inside of the system, there is a latent variable, let's call it Z, mm -hmm. that uh, you can manipulate so as to minimize the output energy, then that Z can be viewed as a representation of a good answer that you can translate into a Y that is a good answer. So this kind of system could be trained in a very similar way. Very similar way, but you have to have this way of preventing collapse, of, of ensuring that 
you know, there is high energy for things you don't train it on. Um, and, and currently it's, it, it's very implicit in LLM. It's done in a way that people don't realize it's being done, but it's, it is being done. It's, it's due to the fact that when you give a high probability to a, a, a word, automatically you give low probability to other words because you only have a finite amount of probability to go around, right? They have to sum to one. Uh -huh. um, so when you minimize the cross entropy or whatever, when you train the, your LLM to produce the, to predict the next word, uh, you're increasing the probability your system will give to the correct word, but you're also decreasing the probability it will give to the incorrect words. Now, indirectly, that gives a low probability to a high probability to sequences of words that are good and low probability to sequences of words that are bad, but it's very indirect. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not obvious why this actually works at all, but um, because you're not doing it on the joint probability of all the symbols in a, in a sequence, you're just doing it kind of, uh, you sort of factorize that probability in terms of uh, conditional probabilities over successive tokens. So how do you do this for visual data? So we've been doing this with OJPA architectures, basically. The with, joint embedding. You know, yeah. So uh, there, the compatibility between two things is, uh, you know, here's, here's uh, an image or a video. Here is a corrupted, shifted, or transformed version of that image or video, or masked. Okay, and then uh, the energy of the system is the prediction error of the representation uh, the the predicted representation of the good thing versus the actual representation of the good thing, right? So, so you run the corrupted image to the system, predict the representation of the the good input and corrupted, and then compute the prediction error. That's the energy of the system. So this system will tell you, this is a good. You know, if this is a good image and this is a corrupted version, it will give you zero energy if those two things are effectively. One of them is a corrupted version of the other. It gives you a high energy if the if the two images are completely different. And hopefully that whole process gives you a really nice c compressed representation of of uh, reality, of visual yeah. reality. And we know it does because then we use those representations as input to a classification system. And then or something, that classification and it works. system works really nicely. Okay.